Welcome to the Three Knockdown Rule. Starring Mario Lopez and Steve Kim. Presented by Hustler Casino and UFC Fight Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule is in effect. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Mr. Manic Monday, Mario Lopez. Oh, a little Bengals reference right there. Susanna I like Hoffster. that. Hey, shout out to Smoking Tim Frazier and Tino, Tino in the corner. And we've got a lot to talk about. Your bout sheet for today's program, Regis Progress. It was not a Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Mm. Tim Zhu, Thunder from Down Under. Yes. Fight review, fight preview. Ask Mario and Final Flurries. And joining us on the championship hotline. Hall of Famer Tim Bradley. But hey. folks, uh, we want to pay homage to our fine sponsors of this program. The Three Knockdown Rule is brought to you by Hustler Casino. It's our favorite local LA casino. Play poker to Pie Gow and home of the most po popular poker live stream in the world, a Southern California staple since the year 2000. Here we go. Also, shout out to our sponsor, a neighbor right here in Hollywood, Oscar Lopez, no relation, from oh, Scap, uh, Micro LA. They offer a unique and innovative hair loss solution for men. I know a lot of fellows out there are concerned about this. So they specialize in scalp micropigmentation. It's also known as, an, as SMT. And basically, they tattoo tiny particles of pigment into the, into the scalp, giving the illusion of hair. I know it sounds a little wild, but it looks really cool. And you never have to worry about... I haircut or losing it again because I'm telling you, it gives it a lot of dens uh, density and you can see results as little as one treatment. It can restore and create a new hairline, um, gives the illusion of close crop hairstyles, camouflage burns if you have it or any sort of skin conditions. They're of the highest quality. So if you're going bald or you're just looking for a new look this summer, go check out our homie Oscar. Call our friends over at Scout Micro LA. Mention this ad for free. Consultation. Again, if you're getting thin... He'll help fill you in. And again, if you'd like to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our show, we still have some slots available. Please reach out to us by emailing info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working with boxbid.io. Mm. Round one. All right, so now we get to round number one from the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans on The Zone. Mario Regis Progre retains his WBC Junior Welterweight title with a split decision in 12 over Daniel Zaria. Uh, what is, what's that old saying? Hey, kid, win tonight, look good in the next one. This was it, right? Listen, you know I like me some Regis. I think he's, he's a, a great fighter, and uh, he's a gentleman. I like how he's articulate. In the first three rounds, I was like, okay. This is going to be an exciting night. We're in for a barn burner. Whoa, I've never seen such a dramatic turn of events <laughs> after three rounds. In the first round, my guy did get knocked down. And later, he um, actually admitted to that, to seeing more on that later. And then in the third round, he ended up dropping um, Zuria, uh, which I thought, okay, now it's set up for, for uh, it's going to be a very interesting match. And then it sort of slipped into too much respect. I think... Zoria, who is very sneaky with his counter punches, has a little more pop than he looks like because he looks kind of like a he's new, loose a newborn giraffe out there. He's and loose that he limbed. looks like he's always, but he's yeah. loose limbed and he's quick, um, letting go with those counter shots. And he's a little more heavy handed than you might think. Well, you can see in the first round with when um, Progre tried to uh, rush inside. But then he gave, so Progre was a little too hesitant to want to engage and did a poor job of cutting off the ring, which he admits. In Zoria, he did look good when he let his hands go. And he had moments. He just didn't do enough, Kim. Had he been a little more assertive, I think he would have had a lot more success and maybe even pulled off the victory. But he did, one guy did a li very little, the other guy did even less. And it became... A very a boring fight, How quite a, frankly, uh, after the third fight. And I appreciated Progray's honesty in his post-fight interview when he admitted to after seeing the replay, he, he did get knocked down, which it was a clean knockdown. And he also admitted to doing a poor job cutting off the ring. And he also admitted to wanting to prove some stuff. That was refreshing to hear. It was refreshing to hear. And also that it was overwhelming Maybe for him to fight in your hometown. A lot of people think that's an advantage. A lot of times you got people calling you, your family hitting you up for tickets. You feel very anxious and, and stressed out. 
because you want to perform well, possibly get a knockout. And a lot of that is a burden. And he recognized that. And and I like that he's an honest kid and he vocalized all that. The only upside I see is that people might be wall- willing to face him a little bit more. Um, but overall, it was a stark contrast to the fight we're going to talk about later featuring Tim Zhu. Yes, 117-110, 118 for Pro Gray. And the other score, 114-113 for the Puerto Rican. Bottom line is Zoria was never going to box like that and get a decision in New Orleans. Mm. It became a tag where nobody was it. A lot of close rounds to decipher and score. But I do think that, I don't want to say championship privilege, but I really felt like, look, like you said, one guy was doing very little. The other guy was happy for it, as the old-timers say. It was a bad fight. It really was. Let's just call that for what it was. And the frustrating thing was I Zuria did have good moments. He just didn't do enough of them. And if and you get frustrated because why didn't he let his hands go? Especially having the success, he knew he liked him. He knocked him down. Yeah. And <laughs> I think it's funny that Zuria. Well, maybe the tr- third round knockdowns. He said, "Okay, now I got to pull back." So now you got the first round knockdown and the third round knockdown on each side, where both guys became very hesitant. Exactly. And you know what happened? He's, Nothing. <laughs> no, the, the, he stunk the place out. And it's ironic because Zuria in Spanish means skunk. Oh wow! So that brings it was a new prelude. meaning to it. Means skunk. So it was a prelude to, to come. Well, and he stunk the place out. After this weekend, let's hope they fumigated the Smoothie King Center. <laughs> uh, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, from Gold Coast, Australia, it was showtime. Tim Zhu with an emphatic statement, oh. blowing out Carlos Ocampo in one. Wow. Uh-oh. Thunder from down under. Ooh. First of all, I felt old watching that fight because I, I vividly remember his dad, yeah. Costa Zoo, fighting just so many great fights. And, and um, there was something on Twitter, and we should talk about it later, some memorable knockouts. Remember, we yeah. were talking about that, and I believe you said um, you said Tarboro versus Roy Jones, yes. which I agree with. But we should do our Mount Rushmore yeah. later. Another one I would add there is Costa Zoo when he knocked out Zab Judah. Yes, I was there. And Oof. Oh, it was such a great fight. And I've never seen, side note, I've never seen it. A son looked more like his father than he also Tim Zoo. Fights like well, him too. that's what I'm saying. He looked so much like his, doesn't he? Tim Zhu uh, was the mother even involved? <laughs> looked so yeah. much like Costa, but that right hand was coming down just like pops. And a guy who's normally notorious for starting out slow, boy, did he start off fast and let those hands go. And he started getting a little reckless in there, but then he kind of gathered himself. And once he let that right hand go, that was all she wrote. And he made a statement and he's been active and it was very impressive. And it was nice to have that balance of one fight that was a little bit of a Zoria skunk mm. <laughs> and another one, w- which was uh, a bonkers. When Tim Zhu won his decision against Trell Gaucher, it's like that old line from the cheese. It's the piece of cheddar, not ready. <laughs> He's ready now. And I'm not saying it's 50-50, but Mario, I thought last year as they were waiting around, I said they're making a mistake by waiting. They've rectified that. In my view, Charla was about a 75-25 or an 80-20 favorite over Zoo. Now I'm thinking... 55-45, maybe 50-50. I think he's closed the gap significantly. Yeah, especially considering Charlo has been inactive and dealing with a hand injury. And they may mandate that fight next, and he'll have to go straight into it. Then it makes Ooh. it very interesting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, he's still a talented guy knows how to fight, but still. Also on the co-feature, big win for Sam Goodman, beating top-ranked Raiz Alim in a really good 12-round scrap in the junior featherweight division. All right, when we come back, we talk to the newest Hall of Famer, the Desert Storm, Tim Bradley, and a word from our commercial sponsors. Catch the streaming live right on YouTube. Right on YouTube. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. $1.2 million. Oh. And I'm losing in this fucking game. What the fuck? This is a 400 k flip. If I win by the way, you get 10 grand. For my fans. What? Wow. All in in a call. I'm not fucking leaving. Raise it up. And we're back on the three knockdown rule. And Mario, we have a very special guest joining us on the championship hotline. No longer just the Desert Storm. It's 
Hall of Famer, Tim Bradley. <laughs> My man, well-deserved and made a beautiful transition as a Hall of Fame fighter to soon-to-be Hall of Fame announcer. So congratulations, brother. I have actually Appreciate been that. to Canastota and have been to the ceremonies right there. Is it what you thought? How was the, uh, uh, the uh, activities that you participated in over the weekend? Look, Mario, I never went. I've never been there. I've been invited several times, probably like 10 times. People invite me every time I go to New York. Come on, come down to the Hall of Fame. Come check it out. And I was like, no, I'm not going to go until I get inducted. You know, and once it happened, I mean, it was a beautiful thing. I mean, walking up the, for those first steps, you know, the, you've been there. So, you know, the first little steps that you walk up. Yep. It just felt like I was walking into heaven, man. It was fantastic. You know, um, I don't know. The energy just kind of took over me. I, I just... You know, I try not to cry in front of my son. <laughs> try not to cry. You know, I just say, hey, man, this is tears of joy, man. This is tears of joy. So, you know, because I want my son to be a man's man, you know, be strong. Um, but I just said, it's okay to be get excited. It's going to have tears of joy. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's okay if one of your loved ones get hurt or something like that and you cry. That's fine. You know, but those are the only reasons why you should cry, son. Um, but it was it was great. It was fantastic seeing all the memorabilia in there of all the champions that, that I've watched growing up man um and just to be a part just being in that room period man is is one hell of an accomplishment in my the way it, one hell of an accomplishment in my mind i think it's, it's crazy because look if you think about it this way there's only been like 200 fighters that's been inducted into the hall of fame and i'm one of them mm, that's wow. unreal man and it's been millions yeah. and millions of fighters yeah tim let's back up a little bit uh Every year they have a certain point where they count the ballots. And the first couple of years you didn't get in. I personally thought you should have got in a little bit sooner. With that being said, when you got noticed that, hey, you're going to Canastota, you got a permanent home, who's the first person you thought of and who's the first person you called? My dad. Hmm. My dad. That was the first person. Um, my dad has been there every step of the way. Always supported me. Uh, worked 365 days a year. Never missed a boxing event. Always tried. I mean, there was times where he didn't have money, you know, and he had to borrow money from, you know, friends, relatives, just to get, just to go to these, these large tournaments out of state. So, um, of course I owe it all to my father, honestly, my mother as well. Um, great mother. I, I would say she was stronger than my father at times. She was a lot harder than my father. My father was constantly working. So my mom was always disciplining us. Um, but you know, she just never, ever, uh, would tell my dad anything about the crazy stuff that he had me doing, man. My dad had me doing some crazy workouts and my mom would be like, that's good. You need, they need to toughen you up. So my mom was just as hard as my father was. So love it. Um, great balance of love there. But uh, well, Tim, I would say my dad for a fact. I want to get into that because you brought up your father and I've known him for years, but here's the thing. He's not your typical boxing father that we see today. He was involved, <laughs> but he's not over involved. Right. I, I mean, some of the stuff you see and some of the stuff you've been involved in, Tim, does it make you shake your head about, the expanded roles in the way fathers are now interjecting themselves into the whole situation. It just needs to be banded. I, I think boxing needs to band, band, father, Whoa. son, wow, banded. Like you, your father cannot be your trainer. Like your father, he can be in the corner or whatever, but he cannot be your trainer. I think it should be banned, honestly, man, because you you just said it. You just said it right there, man. The relationship between the son and the father is horrible. And when they get in, sometimes you get in these big, these tough matches and you see these fathers not stepping in and stopping fights, you know, letting the fights go on too soon or too late. And then, you know, financially, I mean, I don't even want to go down that road. I'll go down that road another time, man, with you guys, as far as, uh, you know, fighters being that possession of their fathers and so on and so forth. That I've sucks, man. I've always found it... Um fascinating because your natural uh you have kids your natural inclination is to want to protect your kids but when you're the trainer of your uh, of your son who happens to be a fighter you're literally sending him into harm's way it's a weird sort of uh dichotomy however there have been very successful unions miguel Cotto and his father shane mosley and his father um trinidad uh in his, mm -hmm. in his father even now with uh teofimo lopez in in his father uh, so it's, and I'm always curious to see how those 
relationships played out later on. And for the most part, I think they they played out pretty well, Mario. Here, oh, post boxing, but I'm saying I think they they've been okay, haven't they, Tim? Yeah, there's been some success stories, to be fair. But I think the bigger issue is now, and I and, and Tim can expound upon this. There used to be a time when fathers were just trainers, right? Now they're getting into managing. Yeah, that's a whole other. And that's deal. the other right. thing. Exactly. And I, a lot of yeah. these fathers don't have other jobs or vocations. They mm -hmm. use their son as an ATM. And yep. I was told by somebody at the upper management of boxing that's in part of the company. They said, Steve, we've always had to deal with fathers. They've always been a problem. They are such a headache now, mm -hmm. more than ever, because they want to be more yep. than just trainers. Would you agree or disagree, Tim? Mm -hmm. I agree 1,000%. 1,000 cents. I, I come from youth sports. So I had we, my wife and I, we had a football program that we ran. The actual kids that joined the program were fantastic to work with. But the parents, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh. The yeah. parents, dealing with the parents, man, was the hardest thing uh, in youth sports. And it's the same thing yeah. with, with boxing now. You know, the fathers, <laughs> you know, they think that they know their son's worth and, and, and so on and so forth. And they, he should be get accommodated. He needs this money. He needs this. And he's, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's a headache. And it's it's getting out of hand, man. And that's why I say that father and, and son bond, man, that needs to be banned from boxing, man. Get rid of it, man. Mm -hmm. It is not a, it's not a good thing. Get rid of it. It'd probably be a lot healthier for, for the relationship. It's funny. And last, and last thing on this point, um, cause my son and he's a little guy he's only nine, but a pretty high level wrestler. You know, these kids get, uh, start getting very competitive at this young age, but the irony with my kid, and I'm sure a lot of dads out there, except not with yours, they don't like to listen to their father, right. <laughs> but I that recognize too. as much as, and I grew up and I knew what I'm doing and it gets frustrating, but I recognize, okay, I'm going to step back. So I have other people coach him. I show up for the tournaments. I'm there for his matches, and I'm supportive in the corner. So I think a little more along the lines of like your dad. But Mario, but there's I a difference. Back. I've seen the way you do it, though. You've actually told your son, okay, you're done. You also say you're not cutting weight. Yeah, exactly. So you've actually allowed him to have his childhood. I, sure. I believe many of these relationships are very tense as these kids grow up. Mm -hmm. Then these kids go into adulthood, even though there's an arrested development. Now you have a situation where that whole relationship dynamic Kim, is thrown I've out seen, of kilter. I've seen kids, fathers slap their kids, Ugh. yelling at them. After, and I'm like, God, the kid's 10 years old. Quit breaking his balls. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, overall, yeah. And I think it's a smarter – um, a, a smarter uh, relationship if you are able to kind of pull back and let others do the thing. But so, yes, I'm glad we covered that. Moving on, I mentioned uh, Teofimo Lopez and his dad. What are your thoughts on his performance um, this uh, this past couple of weeks? I believe it's been now. And do you feel he'll really <laughs> stay retired? I laugh as I ask. Yeah. Which, 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 what part of the question you want me to ask, answer first? Let's talk about his, uh, his performance first. I thought it was a great performance. Um, Hands down, I, I thought it was one of his best performances. I knew he had, I knew he had this type of performances in him. Um, it just takes the right guy to get it out of him. Um, had a hell of a game plan. Um, he actually sparred for this event. I was getting word as the fight was uh, just about to go on um, that he had a really tremendous camp in Florida. That he was sparring, running. He was doing everything he needed to do. Um, of course it was, you know, it was my guys at top rank. They were letting me know and all they're like, man, I think he's going to pull it off. And I was just like, well, I hope so. You know, it, it, he needs to pull this off because it'd be fantastic for his career. But, um, he did, he did a lot of good things in there. Um, counter punching was, was extremely effective explosiveness all the way through the fight. Uh, he was in tremendous shape. Like I said, um, I think, um, on another note, I don't, I don't think this was the best, uh, Taylor that we've seen in recent. I mean, Taylor looked flat from after the second round. He looked flat. Maybe it was the weight. It was maybe it was the you know the fourteen month layoff had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, I, I always get a little skeptical when I see fighters in the beginning of a fight shadow boxing. You know, he's letting his hands go and he's shadow boxing. You know, as he's coming out and then he's shadow boxing in the ring and it's almost like. He's like trying to find his time and like something's not right, you know, and he's trying to get it right before he actually steps in and starts fighting. Um, and I saw that in Taylor and I was just like, I don't know. I don't think he feels that he's ready. I don't know. I don't know. After that second round, I, and my wife texted me because we were I was watching it in my hotel room and she was watching it down uh, downstairs uh, at a bar. Um, uh, by the way, my wife doesn't drink. She was at the bar. They had a big TV there. <laughs> <laughs> Because I already know how you guys go. I know how you guys think. But anyways, let me just make that clear. My wife doesn't drink, neither do I. But anyways, um, she says, is Taylor in trouble in the second round? I say, yeah, he in trouble. 
Mm. Right out the gate, I knew he was in trouble. Um, Miss Brad Tail was just on. on. He was <laughs> he was just on, man. He was on. He was on. He was possessed. Uh, you know, he looked more focused than ever than I've seen in a long time. So great performance by him. But Tim, now we got the quote unquote retirement. It, it's just again, we saw what happened <laughs> after the big win against Lomachenko a couple years ago. Had the Triller escapade, uh, the battle with top rank, and then the loss to Cambosis. Is history repeating itself here with Tiafimo Lopez? Here comes the dump truck, man. You know, and you know me, man. I, I got to keep it one hundred with you, man. I I, I think this guy, uh, Tiafimo Lopez, and I like the kid, man. Like I, I had a relationship with this kid, and you know when I when I said what I said about him as far as him being dog fooded for the one forties, I think that really ticked him off. Um, and so now our relationship has kind of gone south, but, you know, I still think he's a cool kid, but the thing is, is that the kid wants attention, man. Uh, I mean, he is, he, he, I've never seen a man whine and cry so much, man, about his situation, um, about the business of boxing, about what he's not getting about this fighter and that fighter, man, like it, it's ridiculous to watch and, and it's just shameful at the same time. And now he's considered himself retired. I don't know what it has to do with. I don't know if it has to do with his his uh his divorce. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure if it has anything to do with his father because you got to understand this. You know, um, the streets talk, man. Boxing is a small community, yes, but they talk. You know, you got to understand that this kid has been holding down the fort and holding down this family. You know, since he became a professional. You know, he has the responsibility to take care of entire household. Mm -hmm. Understand that, man. You know, when you have that type of pressure, and I'm a man, I have kids, and he has a kid as well, and you have that type of pressure on you each and time out, you know, and you have to deliver, man, you know, it, it gets draining. You know, you get sick and tired of feeling that pressure, feeling that heavy weight on you. And I think that the kid is at the point where he he feels that pressure, and he's just like, man, I'm, I'm done with this, man. Like, you know, uh, I think he said he made a million dollars for this fight. Um, can, again, complaining once again, like that's something that you need to talk to your manager about, man, because to me, I don't think your manager has done a great, good enough job or great enough job if you're only getting paid a million dollars in a fight of this magnitude. So something is wrong there. Yeah, and by the way, real quickly, uh, my my sources tell me that I trust he made over $2 million for that fight, just for the record. It, it's frustrating to hear, obviously, uh, coming off the heels of that performance, and there's so many fun matchups that could be made. So let's hope he has a change of heart. Mo moving on, Tim, um, two fighters uh, this weekend, both uh, led main events, Regis Progre and Tim Zhu. Let's, let's talk about Regis Progre, who in the first three rounds, they were very eventful, and, and, and it looked like it was going to be – uh, uh maybe a, a barn burner and then it pretty much lulled us to sleep after the third round but what were your thoughts on regis and did uh did was it more of the stylistic matchup or was a little rust performing in his hometown just thoughts on his performance in general all the above all the above you said a little rust he's not active enough you know, Regis, that's been Regis' problem. And he understand this. I think he's 35 years old or 34 years old. Yeah. He's not active. He hasn't fought. How many times has he fought in the last three years? Not many. You know, that's a huge problem for a lot of these fighters. And, you know, going back to Teo real quick, he had three fights in 10 months. And that's why he looks so sharp in this fight against Taylor. You know, if you don't sharpen your tools, man, they're not going to work for you. They're not going to work. You're going to look dull. And I think that's what happened with Regis. Um, and also the style of the opponent he was facing. He was facing a, 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 a very awkwardly clever type of guy that had punching power, sneaky, sneaky counterpuncher, um, good timing, had a pretty good damn good IQ. Um, he kept walking to the right side, and and and, and it was crazy to me because I'm saying this is Regis Prograde we're talking about here, but there's still it almost seemed like he still has a lot to learn. Um I was watching him fight, and I was just like, close that right exit. Close that right exit. Why aren't you closing that right exit? You're following this guy. You don't even know how to cut off the ring, and you are like a world champion kid, and you've been in there with the best of the best and the who's who's of this division. You don't even know how to cut off the ring. Like, I was blown away by it. I was like, yeah, oh, my I, gosh. I, I agree, and I really like Regis, too. I think he's an articulate kid, a nice kid, yes. kid and I like the way he fights, and I even appreciated his his comments. He was so honest afterwards. Honest. You know what? I did get knocked down in that first. Oh, I guess I did after seeing that. Yeah. And I should have cut the ring off yeah. a lot better. But but Mario, that, that was refreshing to hear, though. Mario, one thing about Zoria, he has a pretty heavy 
right hand. Yes, and, and like, like Tim said, it is sneaky. And, and after, I think he's a loose limb guy. Right. That even if he throws a fear punch and you run into it as he did in yeah. round one, that kind of made him hesitant. Of course. But to Tim's point, activity matters. Since 2019, when he lost that razor thin fight to Josh Taylor, mm -hmm. there have been years where he's basically fought one time. In fact, last yep. was the only time he's fought two years, two times in a year since 2019 he's also been a guy that a lot of people have tried to avoid so maybe off of this performance the upside could be that more people will be willing to face him so we'll start right. getting some more matchups but i'm good. not writing him off though i'm not gonna write well, him neither off, am i like i'm not writing him people, off either sure. listen to me a lot of people are writing him off because of this performance man i'm not writing this guy off this guy has a ton of skill ton of ability has punching power he's box i mean no i've never seen anyone do what they what he did to uh cepeda what he was able to do against Cepeda uh, blew me away. I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, because I've been in the ring with Cepeda. I know where I, I know how difficult he is to fight. And he made it look easy in there. And Sandor Martin made Tiafimo look very ordinary. Yeah. Again, yes. styles matter. Absolutely. Styles matter. And he did drop him, I believe, in the third, third round, round, too. So, okay, moving on from there in the complete um, different type of event, Tim Zhu. Uh-oh. Really really Ooh, brought uh -oh. it and uh, ironically known for a slow starter boy did my guy uh -oh, start fast this one <laughs> and he he let those hands go and uh another guy that's been sort of active relatively speaking and, second fight in three months exactly it mattered it really did and he looked good he looked confident didn't let the moment get away from him and he was in his hometown and a complete opposite as far as performance do you think it was a performance that would put him in in uh, a discussion for Charlo where it could be a pick him type fighter. Do you still heavily favor Charlo? Oh, he's been he's been at that that level since he uh, beat Harrison. In my opinion, when he beat Tony Harrison, I was blown away by that that performance. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought Tony Harrison was a tricky guy. Mm -hmm. uh, can box, can can move, um, can punch a little bit. I th thought he was just extremely sa savvy and seasoned. But man, and when he was able to get rid of him, I was like, my gosh, he's ready. He's ready for the Charlo. So this performance right here, I think, I think what you know what? I was I was at a fight. I forget what fight it was. But um, you know what? It was the it was the it was the Navarrete um when he fought that last kid he fought. What was his name? Was oh, Liam, it Liam? Liam Liam. Liam. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I got a chance, I got a chance to talk to uh to Tim Zhu's promoter. I got a chance to talk to him. He said that Tim wants to be active. He wants to constantly be active and actively fight. He's not going to just be sitting back waiting because he says this is what he believes. He believes that the Charlos are trying to stall him out mm. and trying to let him get dull. You know what I mean? Get dull and not sharpen his tools at all. But he's, he's staying actively fighting so that way he'll be ready when the opportunity does present itself. Now that he beat Harrison, now that he beat this guy, you got to understand, He's flying high, man. Like, I've seen a lot of maturity and growth in him. Mm. Uh, he a, has a ton of seasoning on him now. He looks confident. And like you said, he didn't wait for the kill. He went out and found it. And he produced it. There's a difference between waiting, sitting back, and trying to be calculated versus a guy that's actually coming forward, being aggressive, and actually setting up his knockout attack. And that's what he did in this fight. You're right. I'm he, impressed. He, I was, too. He looks very confident. He's got a lot of momentum. And now, and I know Charles is coming off the hand injury, and it's been a minute, but I believe it's mandated now that he faces him. So it's not like Charles can get a can get a tune up prior mm. to if he has to face him next after this long fifty uh, fifty bout of inactivity. 50 -50? <laughs> it, it's very interesting. Mario, it's very interesting, Mario Tim. It's interesting you talk about the momentum. Last year in February of two thousand twenty-two, Terrell Gaucher landed a right hand, sent Zoo down, gave me Vince Phillips flashbacks. I'm thinking mm. this kid's not mm. ready. Then. They made the zoo people wait the whole year. And once that late January fight went by the board, as Charlo said, I'm injured. I love the fact that zoo and his people said, okay, hold on. We're going to work on us. It's not about you. It's about us. Smart and, and I think, you know, like, like you said, either you sharpen the blade or it gets dull. Mm -hmm. To me, there is no real gray area. Uh, Tim, this fight has finally been set. I think a lot of us had doubts, but it's going to happen in late July. Errol Spence. Terrence Cropper. We could talk about this later on in the summer. We'll bring you back some early thoughts on that matchup. <clears throat> I think it's a tough match for both guys, to be honest with you. I, I don't think there's no far ground conclusion that either guy can win the fight. I, I'm picking Crawford because I just think he's just more uh, versatile and, and he can he can do more things in the ring. But, you know, Spence is a guy that knows how to do what he does well. 
And I don't think we've seen the best Spence. I don't think that Spence has had to really dig down deep in a fight. I, I think both guys have never had to really dig down deep in a fight. Mm. Um, and people would say, oh, well, you know what? Against Sean Porter, he had to dig down deep. Yeah, he probably did dig down a little deep. But still, Sean Porter fell right into his trap. And that's fighting. He likes to fight. He likes to be aggressive. He throws punches and bunches. And, he, you know, he throws at a lot of volume and hard shots. And you already know that Sean Porter is willing to stay in that wheelhouse. Um, but I've never seen Spence fight off his back foot. I think he has that in his bag too, man. And if but he Tim, has that in his bag where he can adjust and come forward and bag off and fight off his back foot, he's going to be dangerous for Crawford, man. Extremely dangerous. But Tim, are you not concerned that Errol Spence has not fought since April of last year against Ordanis Ugas? We talk about activity and keeping the blade sharp. He hasn't fought in a while. Yeah, I mean that's something that something else that you got to consider in this fight is the activity of his. Of his. Um, but go back and when he he wasn't active when he fought against Ugas, man, and he looked like a freaking monster against Ugas. Um, there were some spots where he looked a little vulnerable, you know, in spots where he was trying to pick up his mouthpiece. He got hit with a shot and he got wobbled a couple of times. But other than that, I mean, he was still busy, still active, still throwing over six hundred punches around. Um, looked like he was in tremendous shape for that fight and strong, and he stopped Ugas, you know, and, and that's without any activity. So Spence is just one of those guys that just knows how to turn it on, man. Well, just I, knows how to turn it on. Go and ahead. I, and I agree with you that activity does matter, but there's a certain, and I, like I mentioned this last week, there's a certain point that you get in certain level of fighter like a Spence where sometimes even a little time off, you know how to fight. You got to get in shape and you know how to fight and you're able to put on performance like you can uh, against Ugas. I too, it's, I think it's a very, very tough fight. I like, I like, um, uh, Crawford so great at making adjustments. You don't know what you're going to get with a southpaw, yeah. or if he's going to fight. Mm -hmm. Like that, he's mean. And there's he's a nasty a Doberman. He, yeah, he's he knows. Doberman. He knows oh. how to close out. But I think it's really, really interesting. One more quick fight before we let you go, just to touch on uh, Tim Inouye and Fulton is coming in late July. How do you see that uh, fight going? Ah man, I keep looking at this fight, and you know, right out the gate, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, anyway, 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 anyway. But man, this is a different weight class. He's fighting against a, a a solid, I mean, solid guy with skill, tremendous skill, heart, will, and a guy that's that's game. He wanted this fight as well, you know, um, and he didn't shy away from it when the fight was offered to him. So you got to respect that, man. Um, uh, Style wise, you got a slick boxer. You got a slick boxer. You know, we never seen a we never seen in a way that when the ring with a slick boxer. Have you can you recall any of the guys that he's been in there with a with a slick boxer that knows how to fight off the back foot, that can fight, you know, at mid-range as well, that can rough you up, that can tie you up. I mean, that can do a lot inside the ring. He's never fought this type of style. So I'm curious to see how he's gonna be able to deal with a guy that's not gonna be there to be hit. Mm -hmm. So um, interesting style, in, interesting styles, I think. Um, but I'm going to say in a way, I, I think that he's just a, a tremendous talent. He's special. Um, he's shown it each time he fights. Uh, I love his power. I love his accuracy. And I love the fact that he's able to have that, that, that stay in power. Uh, his power stays all the way throughout the fight. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it, you know, some guys I see, they have power in the first four or, or first half of the fight. The second half, it kind of fades away. Uh, Manny Pacquiao reminds me of, of, of or in a way reminds me of Manny Pacquiao with that, where he's able to stay disciplined. He's able to keep his technique as well and keep his punching power all the way through the fight. So he's dangerous every moment in there for a guy like Fulton. That's, uh, that's and, a very good point. And that I, torque is it, crazy. <laughs> and I think in a way has yeah. underrated speed and quickness. He's not mm -hmm. just a plotter. Mm -hmm. Tim, I know you're going to be on that call. We'll talk to you before that. I want to ask you one last question before uh, we let you go on with your busy day. You have turned into one of my favorite broadcasters because you are so blunt. Thanks. I love yeah. the ability that you have and the guts to say things that go against top rank and your network. And not a lot of guys do that. I think they play to the agenda. I think they stick to the script. But what was the toughest adjustment in you going from boxer to media? And, and I want to ask you this. Do you have a new appreciation for media when you take the heat for saying stuff and you're like, you know what? That Steve Kim wasn't such a bad guy after all. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Um, I, I think the media, the media is what grew me into what I am today. Uh, not only the media, but the fans. Uh, you, as you know, the, the fans can sway one way or the other, depending on how you look. 
again. And um, but I do have a new appreciation for definitely the, the boxing media and just media in general, because you have to understand that, you know, from my point of view, I'm a fighter. <laughs> I was a fighter first. Now I'm I'm in the media. So a lot of things that I say, a lot of fighters have a hard time with dealing with what I have to say because I was a former fighter. But at the same time, it's hard to find that balance between, you know, telling the truth, you know, and and, and being like you said, like you said, Steve, kind of following the narrative of the network or, or, or so so speak, I should say. But um, I, I think I found it, man. I think I've definitely found it um, to where I'm free to say whatever I feel is right. I know I'm not I'm not dumb. I'm not dumb enough to, to, to you know, to bite the hand that feeds me at all. Um, I love ESPN. But um, the fighters, the fighters themselves, some appreciate me, some don't appreciate me. But at the end of the day, I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. I'm going to just be me. Doesn't matter as long as they respect you. And you know what? If you always come from an honest place, they'll have to. Tim, congratulations on your induction. Thank you. Keep up the great work, buddy. And hopefully we'll uh, I'll do see you in person soon. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you guys, man. And I'm glad y'all back, man. You know, uh, I'm sick of looking at all these other shows. I'm glad y'all back because I know oh. you got some real guys and no boxing. Oh. Um, You know, hell yeah, man. I'm glad y'all back, man. Appreciate Good you. job. All right. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And please, when you're in Thank town, you. you are always invited to join us in studio. Come, come on, man. I, you know I ain't never down your way. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, you we find yourself. Seat. Yeah, yeah, we have a seat right here. All right. Well, Tim. Thank you for joining. Peace, we appreciate you. Take care, buddy. See you later, man. Peace. And that was Tim Bradley. We'll be back. More of the three knockdown rule. Review preview. And we're back on the three knockdown rule, and we get into the fight preview. Saturday night from the theater at Madison Square Garden on The Zone. Edgar Berlanga takes on Jason Quigley. Mario, there comes a point. Now, this is a fight with Quigley. The last time we really saw him, he got blown out in one round by Demetrius Andre. They got him on track by beating a guy whose record was 23-36. and 36, So that was a layup. There a certain point, Berlanga, who we were kind of sort of high on a couple of years ago, he's got to score some sort of knockout here, doesn't he? If he wants, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If he wants to continue to fight at this level, is it? Is it bad that I really want to see Munguia versus Berlanga? No. I actually Would think that be both a fun fight. <laughs> Puerto Rican Mexican. Oh yeah. Both guys are question marks. Right. Both guys, they're harshest critics that you're a bunch of hype jobs, but the mixture of styles, oh me gusta. Who me gusta? gusta? Me gusta. Who you favor? Yeah. Oh Munguia. Yeah. I uh, think yeah. he he he's much more comfortable in a real fight. The one thing that I was disappointed with Berlanga when he fought guys like Steve Rolls. It seemed to me like he was not a fireman, as Tim Bradley was said to by Teddy Atlas. He wasn't going to the fire. He was running away from it. Say what you want about Munguia, for better or worse, My he's a fireman. Well, that's the Mexican in him right there. Berlanga's one of those guys, too, they're so heavy-handed. Maybe if he doesn't take you out right away, then, okay, let me kind of stop and think about figuring things out. I really hope that fight happens. Uh, <laughs> Mario, way, you were there fight. when Fury fought Wilder in that third fight mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. When First Ber fight and the third fight. Yeah, when mm -hmm. Berlanga got knocked down mm -hmm. on that undercard by Cosetis, he got Rosario'd. He started feeling his own fear, and he has not mastered it. Look at the way he fights in terms of his temperament and the aggression. That's not the same guy that was knocking out everyone in one. It's like a bitter reality has hit him. This game is tough. Oh, super tough. I mean, I remember him calling out Canelo not too long ago. No Obviously, boy. he's pumped the brakes on all that. So I'm curious to see how he's going to perform and if he'll get right uh, back on track. Also, on the same night from Showtime, uh, presented by PBC from the Armory in Minneapolis, a triple header. Carlos Adamas takes on Julian Williams for the WBC interim middleweight title. Erickson Lubin takes on Louis Kuba. Arias, and for the IBF Junior Bantamweight title, Fernando Martinez takes on Jade Bornea. And also from the land of the rising sun in Japan, very good rematch here. And they don't have a U.S. Uh, broadcaster yet. Kazuko Ioka takes on Joshua Franco for the WBA Junior Bantamweight title. News and notes. Oh, also, now, we've got to get into some big things here on News & Notes, the big story. We hinted at it. Mm. We gave a bit of a foreshadowing, and now it, it is come to fruition. Late last week, Golden Boy and Oscar De La Hoya has filed a suit against Ryan Garcia and mainly against his advisor lawyer, Lupe Valencia. Uh-oh. Look, we hinted at it. 
it seemed uh, I- inevitable. I don't think um, Garcia or, or Lupe, for that matter, have much to stand on. What are they going to say? You didn't come to my post-fight press conference that we want out of this contract? You defeat the whole purpose of a contract. A contract is what it is. You signed up for it. And look at Mikey Garcia when he tried to break from uh, Bob Arum. He made him sit, what, almost three years? Two and a half year hiatus. Look at that. And I think, coincidentally, it's about the same time. There's about three years left on this yes. contract. And Oscar wants to dig his heels in the sand. And he's like, look, we put a lot of time and invested a lot in this guy. And... You can't blame us for that last performance and the stipulations that were agreed upon because you essentially had your guy agree to it before we could get there. So I think he mainly is directing a lot of that anger towards the advisor who feels, who he feels betrayed him. I hope he work, they work it out and come to their senses quickly because again, with um, Pro Gray based on his performance and and uh, Tio coming off of his, whether we we know he's retired. Uh, technically, but I don't think that's really going to last. There's a lot of fun matchups to be made, lucrative matchups to be made for Garcia, so I hope it gets resolved quickly. I read one of the stories where Garcia's lawyer that's representing him in this case talked about disparagement. They're not They're not always supportive. They don't like me. It reminds me of this famous lawsuit that took place in Britain with Mickey Duff, famous old promoter manager, one of, a true boxing guy. He was in a battle with Lloyd Hunnigan, best known for beating Donald Curry as a world champion in the 80s. So they're, they're on trial and like they're trying to, the thing goes sideways. And Hunnigan's lawyer says to Mickey Duff, well, Mr. Duff, is it true that you don't like Lloyd Hunnigan? So Mickey Duff goes, come here. Yeah, can I have my contract, please? So he gets the contract. <laughs> Where does it say here that I have he to starts like him? And <laughs> starts reading over. And the judge goes, Mr. Duff, what is this? He goes, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, I've read my contract. No one, nowhere in here does it stipulate that I have to like the guy. Exactly. So I don't know. Is, so is that a breach that he mean tweeted me? Is that really a breach? And that was Honestly. a counterpunch mean tweet, by yes, the way. Yes, <laughs> by the way, masterfully done. Mario, Canelo needs a dance partner. Huh. Badu Jack is not going to... Look, I actually agree with Badu Jack. Do, do you think it's a little bit much of, of Canelo to ask anyone, come in 20 pounds below the cruiserweight <laughs> limit, and I'm going to put a rehydration clause? Cut really? off your arm. I love me some Canelo, but, but you're I mean, the cut, guy to cut off his, his leg, really. Uh, I don't... I, gosh, why won't the Benavides fight get made, you think? Too dangerous. Really? Not, I think so. I See, Canelo always wants to fight... Um, Dangerous guys, the best guys in the division. I I don't know if it's necessarily that, or maybe just the timing for it. I I because his history doesn't show that he's ever reluctant to face dangerous guys. But maybe him and his own management, led by Eddie Reynoso, feel like you know what, my guy's still very good, but it's the descent. Mm. He's declining. Maybe we don't need that in our lives right now. He's all well, wrong for he's us. He's all baby. wrong for us, right? Okay. Um, and here's the other issue: Jermall Charlo, very good fighter. But you're going to take on a guy that's moving up in weight who has not fought in two years. That fight in itself is flawed. I would take that fight. Just no, it, it looks good. On it does. Paper. But look, we have to be fair about this. If you're not going to fight Benavidez or Bivol or better Biev, I'm thinking, oh, God. I'm not it, mad at the Charlo fight. If he takes that, I think that would be Even good. with the two-year layoff. Sure, just because of the marketability. Okay, that's different, though. But in yeah. terms of the actual... Fight itself. Right, you're getting into the weeds. There's other fights yeah. I'd like to see, but I wouldn't hate that fight. Uh, also, August 26th, reported by Mike Coppinger of ESPN. Really good fight at the junior welterweight division. IVF belt holder Subriel Matias takes on Sergey Lipinet. Mm. Oh, and we have to mention this. Uh, Motley Lopez has vacated his 140-pound WBO title. So Teofimo, he's really playing this retirement thing to the health, old Motley, huh? You're a fool. What? <laughs> I, here's the thing that gets me about Tiafimo. We talked about this with Tim Bradley. If you're saying you're retired, but then on one hand you're saying, yeah, but you know, the next deal I need is not only nine figures. Get this. <laughs> now it's got to be with the network, not with their promoter. Oh, what? God. I hope his shenanigans that? don't last too long because we want to keep this momentum going. Let's not have squander this Loma again. 2.0. Right. All right. So we'll be back with more three knockdown rule. We wrap it up with Ask Mario and final flurries.
we're back on the three knockdown rule. We go to the Ask Mario segment of this fine program from Chris Andre Boxing, who has a really excellent uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he talked about Zoria keeping it long and being a stylistic nightmare. He, this is interesting. He says, um, Devin Haney does this excellently. So would he be a nightmare for Regis stylistically, or does Zoria have the type of power that kept Pro Gray from taking risks that wouldn't apply with Haney? Good that is interesting. Good observation, and I actually thought about that, and I believe Bill Haney was also in attendance, Devin Haney's dad, at this Your night, old buddy. As well, my buddy. Not Lee, Bill. <laughs> Not Lee. Not Lee. <laughs> Lee may have been there, I don't know. <laughs> Getting his but, pump on. <laughs> but Bill, very nice guy, by the way, Bill. Yeah. Shout out to him. It was really cool to talk to. Um, I thought about it, but I don't think Haney has the pop right. that Zoria has, and that is where the respect factor He'll come uh, right through the driveway. In. He'll come exactly. right through the driveway. So I think, and... Coincidentally, I forgot to mention this. I was at Brickhouse Boxing Club earlier this day talking with Julian Chua, trainer mm. of Pro Gray, and he told me that Pro Gray is on his way to L.A. now to start training. I and like to that. Get, I really like that, Be too. Be a pro. He's a, it's exactly it. He's acting like a pro. He wasn't satisfied with his performance. He's coming to work on those things, and I don't think it would be the same um, necessarily – uh, same program that we would see. I think I think that power difference is just it's different. The difference. It'll make you react differently. Of and here's one from my guy Jules at Ring IQ Boxing Talk, who who's a very clever guy. Does he? I really enjoy his stuff on YouTube. He says, "Who does Mario blame for program versus Zaria? Was it more on Regis for not cutting off the ring, or Zaria doing his best impression of the Roadrunner?" Beep beep. I think both. I think both. it was. I think it was both. And again, he talked about how um, he wasn't as relaxed and comfortable fighting in his hometown. So I think it was a lot of those uh, factors. I was curious as to why Eddie Hearn didn't put that fight more in Houston because Houston's actually where he trains more out of. It's more of a fight town. I think next fight, if they want to do a hometown fight, that'd be probably. I heard better. it's going to be in Texas. The next one. There you go. And again, hometown. Again, is it where you live or where you grew up? That's what's one of those. Guys, but New Orleans, Houston, pretty close in the city. They anyway, are. So yeah. Uh, here's one from Yoda. Not <laughs> boxing related, but what would you recommend? I was waiting for the Yoda voice. Yeah. Oh, there's one for Yoda. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> what would you recommend for someone visiting LA for the first time to do? Oh, just visiting, coming from. Yeah. Usually. People when they come to LA, everybody. It's funny because all my East Coast friends assume everyone lives by the beach. That the whole, all of the uh, Los Angeles civilizations is based at the beach, and that is that's not the case. We hardly ever yeah. right go to the beach in the summertime. We'll go and take the kids and whatever. But if you're in the landlocked state, you got it. You you got to visit the beach, and there's a lot of fun stuff to do there. Everybody's at the beach. Got to go into Hollywood, see all all the stuff that's uh, offered there. Try to catch a show maybe at the Hollywood Bowl. That'd be mm. fun. Okay, and also Universal City. Very there you packed. go. Yeah, a lot of people. There you here. go. A lot of theme parks. Hit the theme parks. There you go. Yeah. Final flurries. Um, going on to final flurries, Mario. I, I got to defend somebody. There's some some performer. I think his name is Baby Fat or what's his oh, you're face? So stupid. So wait, let um, me set this up. Let me set this up because you're a rap this, bastard. Who is this guy? Well, Frazier, we were talking about it this on the jabroni. radio show. How Anita, cold as ice, Baker, Miss Baker to you, kicked Be off, respectful. kicked off, kicked out. Uh, Babyface fired, fired what? Babyface as her opening act, which, by the way, he should have never been an opening act. That should have been a co-headlining um, oh, really? tour. Yes. I beg to and, differ. No, no, no. Hold on. And and it wasn't even Babyface who said anything. It was the fans, right? The fans were complaining. Yo, my guy Babyface might be the best R&B writer of all time. It, what are you looking at that face? Do you even know R&B? His jams are incredible. He actually, an argument could be made, could be the headliner. I know you're a big Anita <laughs> fan. But, Excuse me? Uh, but she was out of oh, pocket. Oh, oh, I didn't on. realize she was that cold as ice. Can I just tell you something? The fact that Anita Baker wanted to treat that audience to more her and less him... I would have if I if I was part the of that audience. Like he's a bum. He's you not a bum. What, you know what I would have done if I was in that audience? I would have Venmoed her more money. Wow. I would have said, "Wow, Miss Baker." You know what? Wow. I would have said, "No one in the world, just because 365 days of the year, <laughs> I want to listen to you." And I just, you know what? Listening to her is like sweet love. I and so this, this guy, I love bow down and I back love off, Anita bro. Baker, but Babyface, bro, Babyface is next Baby, level. I'm gonna have to check out his stuff. Never what? heard of him. I showed you. I sent Never you a thing on IG. I mean, he's not, he's no face. Anita Baker. I, I'm just going to say one thing. Again, Miss Baker has such a professionalism. She said, you know what? 
Real these, professional. Kick these, off your opening. <laughs> these fine people deserve more of me. Wow. And for her to do that shows you how much she can. Yeah, she could have easily done just a 45-minute set. She says, no, no, I'm giving you 90 minutes to two hours of moi. Just because. She loves you just because. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Wow. Baby face. Have some respect, okay? Dang, Whatever I'm your face name. R&B fans out there are, like, embarrassed for you. No, on. no, I cannot wait to get tickets because more her, <laughs> yes. Uh, by the way, what happened to your car? Didn't you try to get home early on Saturday? Dude, Do you want I was Efficient I was such a fan. I got my first electric car. I think I mentioned that a while back. Oh, was, Mr. Green here. And I was okay. not. I don't know that. My, some teenage girl I told you was texting or drinking. Dry, totaled my other car, so I had to get a new Ooh, one. The guy at the dealership convinced me to get the electric one. I was like, all right, I got it, and I liked it. Super fast. Obviously, you don't spend money on gas. And the bonus, you can use the the diamond lane, carpool lane, Ooh. without having anyone in it. That's right. And if you're tooling around town, awesome. But Mm-mm. if you got to drive further than a couple hours, and we had to drive to San Diego. What, this is shady, the casino. I had to do something at the casino. They only charged the car. It must be for like 15 minutes. So it was supposed to be fully charged. I think because they want to keep you there, right? Mm. So I was about 30 mm. miles short to Uh-oh. get home. And it's not like when you're on E in a regular gas power. You still got some miles left. You still got some miles. No, it's like a phone. It shuts off. You're done. E is E. E is E. Ooh. So we went e. to these gas or pardon me, these EV stations, right? Well, there's different levels. I did not know that. Each one, I'd stay 10, 15 minutes, and it would only go up a mile or two. Meanwhile, as I'm driving to them, those 30 miles are becoming 35 miles, 39 miles. <laughs> I'm getting so frustrated. Three and a half hours it took me to finally find Electric City. What was it called? Electrified City or Electrify something? Electrify America. Electrify America. Those are the ones with the power chargers. Electrify America. My boy Esterman was here. I was venting the whole time. Electrify America... And then it's supercharged and it could fill up your thing in like 15 minutes. But it was such a pain in the butt. It's like totally changed my mind against the electric vehicle. If you're going to tool around town, the moral of the story is electric vehicle is the way to go. But if you got long distance driving or a, God forbid a road trip. No, 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 no. No, I've said that. But you the, are screwed. Or and they got to figure that. They got to figure that stuff or out. Or have a special car for the trips to the casino. Dude, I guess exactly. I mean, shady. Casinos are shady right there. They get you there. They pump up the AC. They remove the clocks. All the one to keep. I didn't even, I got done at three. I didn't get on the road till like 7.30. I remember the I was mo- so pissed. I'm, I know you must remember <laughs> Casino. Yeah. <laughs> they had that one scene where the Japanese guy had that's a exactly big it, night. That's exactly it. And they're like, uh, uh, that, <laughs> oh, that no, plane doesn't, doesn't work. That's what I'm saying. They that's took exactly back his it. money. That's what How they do. How frustrated was I? Oh my, you called I me. So pissed. And then I then I ruined your night by saying, hey, uh, go ahead, watch the pro gray fight. Yeah, and exactly. You've held I'm it against put me. Put you in the face right All now. All right, anyway, that's it. For oh, this quick week. shout out. Yes. I want to give a quick shout out yes, to please. a former two time UFC heavyweight champion, oh. Daniel Cormier. Nice guy. Dad Bod Cormier. Like Dad, that Dad guy. Dad Cormier. Not only, coincidentally, just like Tim Bradley, has done an excellent job transitioning into being a fantastic. Uh, announcer now, broadcaster for UFC, and such a great guy. I always told him he's going to have a career like Michael Strahan, able to transition and all that. But he still gives back to the kids, and he runs a camp, a wrestling academy with a lot of tough kids. And my kid is out there, and he's uh, he's like, oh, your boys won't want to scrap, calling guys out, and he, it just made my day. But I love that he's giving back to these kids, running these, for these the high-level wrestling for the academy, and my son... Uh, Dominic's out there having a good time. So I just think that's cool. Tip of the hat to Mr. Cormier. All right. We want to thank our sponsors for this show. And a friendly reminder, if you'd like to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our show, we still have some slots available. Please reach out to us by emailing us at info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working with Boxbid.io. So on behalf of Mario Lopez, Smokin' Tim Frazier, Tino, and myself, till the next round, goodbye, everybody.